One of the most routinely overlooked civilizations of late antiquity and the early Middle Ages is the Sasanian Persian Empire. Today I'm going to begin a short video series in two parts. This first video will look at the culture and institutions of Sasanian Persia, and my next video will look at its history in a brief outline. So let's get started talking about the culture and institutions of this often overlooked empire. One of the biggest reasons why there's not more material available in English on the Sasanian Persian Empire is simply that we have some pretty severe source limitations. And basically it's not so much an issue of production, we know that the Persians put out quite a bit of material, it's just a matter of survival. Um, so our only real historical narratives about Persian history come from Roman and Byzantine sources and then later Arabic accounts which sometimes draw on records kept by the Persians. Um, needless to say, both of these sources of information tend to be pretty biased. There is one surviving Persian text and that is called The Deeds of Ardashir. Um, it's a pretty interesting text. I recommend you read it if you get the chance. And um, for the most part though, if we want to look at a Sasanian perspective for the events of Sasanian history and look at their institutions, we mostly are reliant upon surviving monuments. We still have quite a few of those and we also have material remains in general like this bull. We can see um, you know, what mattered to rulers, how rulers wanted to portray themselves. Um, what I'm getting at is that basically the only thing we can really establish by looking at material culture or the Sasanians is mostly the perspective of the elite but it's still a Sasanian perspective. Um, as for the perspective of the commoners, we're simply unable to say much of value. Let's look at the basic civic structure of the Sasanian Empire. So at the top of the government was the Shahanshah, the King of Kings. He was an absolute monarch or pretty close to it. He did have some limitations on his power imposed by the fact that there were powerful nobles, but he was more or less the um, successor of the Achaemenid era Persian kings, and the title is the same, Shahan Shah. There's also a title for Queen of Queens, Banbishnan Banbishan. Um, however, queens in Sasanian society were not terribly powerful. However, they did have a pretty strong symbolic power, as indicated by this name. The state religion of the Sasanian Persian Empire was Zoroastrianism the same state religion that the Achaemenids and Parthians had had as well, and the Magi remained powerful forces in politics in the empire. The capital of the Persian Empire under the Sasanians was located at Ctesiphon, the same city that the Parthians used. That city is in modern Iraq, and it's between um, settlements that are still occupied. The picture on your right is actually one of the ruins at Ctesiphon. Now, the bureaucracy in the Sasanian state was very strong, and it was headed by a Grand Vizier, and under the Grand Vizier were several heads of departments who were very powerful in individuals. There were about four or five of them who were um, really instrumental in running the government. And there also were powerful aristocratic houses which held you know, considerable local autonomy. Um, however, this group of families was much larger than the seven or so families which ran the Parthian Empire. So power had become more dispersed under the Sasanians than it had been under the Parthians, and that's part of why the Shahanshah and his close advisors were able to direct the empire from Ctesiphon, and they were much more rarely hamstrung by their aristocrats than the Parthians had been. One thing that we can gather from Sasanian era inscriptions and monuments is that there was a direct correlation between victory over foreign powers and the legitimacy of both the state in general and a monarch in particular. The early victories by the first Sasanian kings really helped establish the identity of this new state as opposed to its Parthian predecessor and really gave it both its legitimacy and its identity. Um, Shapur I, who is the second monarch of the Sasanians after Ardashir, um, famously defeated two Roman emperors and received their submission. And the inscription on the right is something which, um, you know, celebrated that fact. 
So we see here that the Emperor Valyrian is submitting to the mounted Shahanshah while standing and Philip the Arab is kneeling. This um, inscription is at a place called Nash Nashke e Rustam. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, most likely not. Anyway, um, this was carved into the side of a mountain and it was clearly something which established both the Sasanian dynasty in general and um, Shapur I in particular. Um, and again, victories over barbarians are really what gives legitimacy to any king and the state in general. Um, so kings often, when they come to power, will seek to win a victory. And that will be something which will then sort of confirm that they are worthy of their office. Um, a similar trend applied to the Achaemenids back in the um, classical world. And part of why Xerxes invaded Greece, as seen in the movie 300, is because it was customary for kings at his time to add something to the Persian Empire. So this is reviving a tradition which goes way back in Persian history to the very beginning. Let's talk briefly about aristocratic culture under the Sasanians. So basically, this was a culture of the warrior. Sasanian aristocrats really wanted to emulate the deeds of their Achaemenid predecessors, just as the kings of the Sasanians tried to emulate the deeds of their Achaemenid predecessors. Aristocrats would train in horsemanship, archery, and hunting. These are the appropriate activities for a well-born male. These are the things that you do if you're a male born into a wealthy family. And these are activities which help you become a better warrior and better achieve glory for your people. So it's a fairly straightforward culture and we see that in their artwork and in their literature over and over it's the motifs of warriors and hunting and there's not really a lot of variety outside of that. As you probably guessed, however, the Shahan Shah, his family, and the great aristocratic houses of the Sasanian Empire were but a small minority, and there were plenty of other people who did not fit into that category. Um, below the Shahan Shah, there's a category called the Wuzurgan. These This translates roughly to something like grandees or big men or something along those lines. And that includes the royal princes, local rulers, so the governors of various provinces, you know, the big generals, um, the great warlords, um, you know, the regional rulers, the guys who uh, rule little client kingdoms such as the Lakhmid Arabs, um, priest of the Zoroastrian religion, these guys are all in this upper crust of the Wuzurgan or grandees or however you want to say it. Um, now, historians actually believe that there was a four-tiered class system and that this was divided between priests at the top, warriors just below them, commoners and artisans, and obviously this four-tiered class system does not include uh, the Wuzurgan or the Shahanshah who are above and apart from this distinction which only applies to people below that really elite stratus of society. And although it's normal to think that once the Islamic conquest happened that all that had come before was swept away, but the truth is that just as with the lands that the Byzantines lost to the Arab conquest, local traditions would continue for centuries, and actually the Sasanian caste system would go on to influence the um, societies of the Umayyad and Abbasid caliphates to a pretty a large extent. Unlike their great rivals to the west, the Romans, the Sasanians did not have mass-scale slavery. Just like most ancient and medieval societies, when there are slaves present, they are at the very bottom rung of society. However, just like the Romans and also the Greeks, the Persians did allow for some upward mobility for slaves and also they allowed for manumission. So let's get into the weeds of this. So, there is more than one type of slave in Sasanian society. There's one type who are basically just debtors, and their way to pay their debt often involved serving time at one of the Zoroastrian fire temples as an assistant, you know, someone who keeps the fires kindled or fetches stuff for the priest or whatever the case might be. 
So in that sense, a lot of slaves are more like indentured servants than slaves in the um, classical sense. If, we're, if we use the New World distinction between slave and indentured servant, then many of the slaves in Persia were actually indentured servants. However, there are slave slaves as well. Uh, the most common use of slaves was in households and in temples, so people who would help you with farm work or, you know, help clean the house or whatnot, and then the previously mentioned temple slaves, some of whom might have been permanent rather than simply debtors who were working off a debt for an, a set amount of time. Um, now, one thing that probably won't surprise you too much is that masters did have control over the bodies and sexuality of their slaves, and it was pretty common for a master to force a female slave to produce his children. And implicit in that is the simple fact that any slave is potentially a sex slave. Um, the ter the, a category of sex slave just refers to the primary purpose of a slave. However, if someone is owned, you know, mind, soul, and body by another human being, then they can and will be forced to perform sexual acts, especially if that slave happens to be a female, and you're living in a society which is as male-dominant as the Sasanians are. Um, now, slaves in this society do receive wages, which is comparable to what was the case in ancient Greece. Um, and, surprisingly, despite the fact that masters could make female slaves produce children for them, male and female slaves had the right to have their own families and to keep those families together. It's also illegal to harm a slave. So, unlike in Rome, where slaves can be beaten to death with no real penalty, um, in Persia, even if the king went and randomly punched a slave, the king could be punished through some legal means. And, as in Rome, manumission, the freeing of slaves either upon the death of the master or upon the slave achieving some goal that he and the master had agreed upon at some point, was pretty common and also encouraged. Um, you know, in a society where they value slaves enough to have some laws to protect them, they also like to see people get out of slavery and eventually go on to set up a better life for their children. However, um, the only thing you can look at, the only way in which this might be somewhat rosy is if you're comparing it to slavery in Rome. Um, however, remember, all slavery is pretty damn bad, and, um, you know, being better than, like, the Nazis is not necessarily being good. So, you know, never overlook the human suffering that went on here. And also remember that Iran and Iraq, the core territories of the Sasanian Empire, were extremely hot. And, uh, you know, if you're an agricultural slave, your life was pretty bad. Given what we've learned so far about Persia being a warrior culture and the way that female slaves were worse treated than male slaves, it shouldn't come as much of a surprise to you that women in Sasanian Persia did not have many rights, even when compared to women in ancient Greece or ancient Rome, which are often accused of being misogynistic societies. Um, women in Sasanian Persia, as with pretty much every ancient or medieval society that I've ever studied, are expected to accept domesticity and submission to their husbands and other male authority figures in their lives. Um, Unlike in um, Greece and Rome, however, women had no real role in religion. And so that means that they don't have priestesses in Persia. They only have priests. Um, only two ruling queens ever emerged in the Sasanian dynasty. And those were only in power because there was no adult male to take control. And as soon as one of the young men came of age and came out of hiding, the second of the two queens was deposed. The coin there is from Queen Boran. Now, women in Sasanian society are always under male guardianship unless they are a widow with children, in which case they can temporarily become the guardian. Um, however, as soon as a son would turn age 15, which was the age of adulthood, he would become the guardian and his mother would become his dependent.
Women tend to be married off at about the age of 15 or so, so the age of adulthood for women is also 15, just as it is for men. There are multiple categories of marriage in Sasanian society. Um, there is a privileged marriage, which is the highest version, and what that means is that the contract was arranged by the parents of the bride and groom, and that the husband has a lot of obligations to the wife, and has to meet those or you know face consequences. A subordinate marriage is pretty similar to a privileged marriage, however, there are just less things built in that the husband has to do. And there's also a self-entrusted marriage. Now, one right that Sasanian women do have is that they do not have to go through with a wedding that their father arranges for them, and they do have the right to then go and just marry whoever they want. The problem is when there's a self-entrusted marriage, that means that the girl gives herself to a man, her husband is not obligated to take care of her and um, look after her, so he could potentially you know, up and leave and not be legally liable for her upkeep. And she also would not be admitted to his family as in a privileged marriage. However, she could gain the rights of a privileged marriage if she sired a son and that son lived to become an adult, meaning that she proved herself to be a worthy wife by producing a new potential Sasanian warrior. Now I'd like to briefly look at what the grand strategy of the Sasanian Empire is. And the grand strategy is just sort of the general plan to defend the empire or expand it against all enemies and to maintain the forces that uh, the empire can field. So just like the Romans, the Sasanians support client kingdoms. They have monarchs who they back and send money and troops to, and this creates buffers. Um, they like to have buffers between themselves and the Romans as much as possible, every bit as much as the Romans like to have buffers between themselves and the Sasanians. They also have fortified zones, which are fairly comparable to the kind of fortified zones the Romans have. Um, the, the Sasanians set up their fortified zones in Mesopotamia facing the Roman frontier. And that includes fortified cities and also just you know defensive barriers of various kinds, gates, uh, bridges, etc. Um, they have a fortified zone facing Arabia, and they eventually turn that over to the Lachmedes, and they set up a kingdom there. But they were worried about raids by Arabs, which was something that happened quite a bit, so that's why they fortified that area. And also the Caucasus Mountains are another area of concern for the Persians. So they would intervene there periodically. They had fortifications, and sometimes they would back a local ruler to try to create stability and lessen the amount of raids that they suffered. Um, the Sasanian army was a combination of a strong cavalry, which included a lot of members of the upper class, and these guys could ride to the rescue pretty quickly, so the army is pretty fast and for that reason. However, they don't have a professional infantry and they rely on local levies. So on the, the one hand, they can always move their cavalry to a new place and then raise um, foot soldiers pretty quickly and then have infantry. However, those infantry kind of suck. So for the most part, the Persians are best when they have a defensive fortification or they can fight in the open with their cavalry. Um, and they can then relieve these fortifications with this fast army. So that's sort of what they try to do, and that also protects their interior from raids and devastation. Now, eventually, they'll figure out a way to get the Romans to help them pay for their own upkeep, because um, a group called the Heptolites will begin to threaten the Persians, and they will be able to make the case to the Romans that these people are also a potential threat to them if they're able to penetrate the boundary Therefore, the Romans should pay the Persians money to maintain this defense for Persia. And the Romans are mostly willing to play ball, partly because the Romans had other priorities like trying to reconquer the West and you know, do something other than fight Persia over Mesopotamia. Now, we also know that the Sasanians had a small navy. We only know this because of the Siege of Constantinople in 626 when they tried to use this navy to blockade the capital of the Byzantines. However, this navy was not very large and it also wasn't very high quality and it's pretty much only useful for unopposed landings of troops 
um, whenever it got into combat, so far as we know, it got thoroughly trounced by the Roman fleet of the time. In the past, I've talked quite a bit about the Roman army, and I've also mentioned in brief a lot of battles between Rome and Persia, so I figured you probably would like a look under the hood of the Persian army, so let's take a look. Um, as soon as the Sasanians took over for the Parthians, what we see immediately is that the siege capabilities of the Persians increased dramatically and are now comparable to what the Romans are able to do. So now they have the ability to tunnel, which is a way that you dig under walls and make them collapse. Um, you have siege towers and other things that can batter down walls. And just all the normal things you associate with ancient and medieval sieges are now in the hands of the Persians for the first time. We also see that the Sasanians were able to get war elephants. Now, for the most part, it doesn't look like they were using them in battle very much, so they're not using them the way that Hannibal was using them. However, um, elephants are very strong, so they are useful in sieges because they're good at carrying things around and hauling siege towers into place. So these war elephants are for more than just looks and, you know, rides at a zoo. Um, the Sasanians frequently hired mercenaries from beyond their frontiers, just as the Romans had done. As I mentioned earlier, they have a low-quality levied infantry that they would often deploy. Um, this was a bit of a liability, and it's definitely the biggest weakness in their game. Cavalry were definitely the backbone of the Persian army. This is part of their grand strategy to have a rapid response to any attack. And it's also part of their culture. Um, hunting was often done on horseback. So it sort of reinforces their aristocratic Persian heritage in many ways. And sort of the main cavalrymen of, or at least the iconic cavalrymen of the day, was the cataphract, which is basically a heavy armored soldier on horseback, and he also would have armor on his horse. And the Persians use this kind of scale arm, which looks like a fish scale. Um, now, obviously, this heavily influenced the West, and the direct descendants of the cataphracts are obviously knights. Um, it's a pretty direct line of descent, of descent. You know, the Sasanians started deploying these guys, the Romans and Byzantines copied, and uh, the Western European powers would then copy the Byzantines and ended up adopting soldiers which are basically identical to this. One, basically, the. Um, the soldier type that had been the standard for the Parthian army was the mounted archer, and these mounted archers would ride with um, the cataphracts, and they would be in their own units, and then they would harass the enemy and try to draw in the enemy by you know raining down arrows on them. And when the enemy would eventually lose discipline and charge angrily at them, the um, Sasanians would retreat, and then when the enemy had lost their cohesion they would then turn and charge and that's when the cataphracts would come into play and that tactic of drawing out the enemy and then charging them when they're strung out is called the Parthian shot this is not something the Sasanians invented obviously the Parthians get credit for it even though it had been practiced before the Parthians they were just the ones who perfected it however this is sort of the um, theory of what a Sasanian army would, would want to do in an ideal situation. You know, they really want to draw you out, string you out, and then attack you when you're at your weakest. There's also a new core of immortals modeled on the immortals of the Achaemenid era. And these immortals, however, are basically other cataphracts who are lower-ranking nobles, and they're very comparable to knights, um, and especially knights who were responsible for guarding the king. And that's basically what they were. And in true Persian tradition of having an immortal unit, as soon as one man was killed, he was immediately replaced, and this unit was kept up the strength at all cost. Now, um, because the Sasanian heavy cavalry were so effective, and because the Parthian shot is so effective, um, the equipment and tactics that the Sasanians and their predecessors used heavily influenced neighbors, and it will basically be copied by everyone. Just like Rome, the Sasanians had a state religion, and their state religion was Zoroastrianism. And just like the Romans, the Sasanians were very interested in promoting the correct form of that religion, and the form that they chose to promote was called the Zerbanite form. Um, 
when they would capture new territories, the Sasanians would try to spread their beliefs and practices to their neighbors by building fire temples in the captured territories and encouraging people to participate in their religious ceremonies. They did try very hard to spread the religion to the Caucasus, but they were unsuccessful because Georgia and Armenia would eventually go Eastern Christian by about the late 5th century, and that was probably due to a combination of Rome sending out more missionaries and also the Roman political presence there being either more acceptable to the locals or um, just simply being stronger and more pervasive. Anytime that you have a state-sanctioned religion, persecution of minority faiths is almost a guarantee. Um, in this way, the Sasanians are a lot like the Romans, and also like the Romans, though, persecution was more the exception than the rule. Now, there are several minority faiths in the Sasanian realm, but I've only chosen to focus on a few. Um, first up is Manichaeism. This is something which originated in Persia. Um, the philosopher Mani was actually someone who received patronage from one of the Sasanian monarchs. So this is something that they were fairly tolerant of. Nestorian and Jacobite Christians were people who were often the subjects who would switch back and forth between Rome and Persia as the borders shifted. And they were also Christians who were more or less forced out by the Romans and Byzantines for being heretics. And they would be accepted into the Persian Empire. Um, now, the compromise that they reached in order to assure the Persians of their loyalty is that the churches would use Syriac, a common spoken language on the um, coast of the Near East in Syria and even in Iraq and not use Greek, which was too closely associated with the Byzantine Empire and, you know, classical Greek heritage. Now, there are sporadic persecutions of Roman Christians, meaning Christians who were um, Orthodox Christians, but for the most part, that was something that didn't happen a lot. Um, and the reason why they would go after Orthodox Christians is because they assumed that because these people held the same religious views as the Roman state, that they must be spies or a fifth column which would revolt and help out the Roman army when it came to town, as it did every, you know, two or three years, it seems like. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that our knowledge of Persian culture and history is greatly limited by the limitations of our sources. Um, so, I'm briefly going to try to describe the art, science, and literature of the Sasanian Persians. And grant, uh, what I want you to keep in mind is that what little we can find is only a pretty small sample size of what there once was. Now, from what we can tell, the Sasanians gladly took up the um, signs and symbols of the Achaemenid era, and they also took up the Hellenistic tropes of art, so the um, art forms which were pioneered under the successor kingdoms after Alexander when you had um, Greeks and also Hellenized people in general working with Greek ideas. So basically this is a full circle of what had gone before in this area. So everything from the ancient Near East, the Persians of ancient times, and then the successors who had used Greek influence, Greek uh, inspired art. This is something that the Sasanians pick up and then move forward with and add their own twist to. And this art style will then be inherited by early Islamic society, and that's why you can see quite a few similarities between Persian art and Byzantine art and Islamic art. They all work with a lot of similar traditions and they are not completely foreign to one another. The great patron among the Shahan Shahs of Persia was Chazros I. Um, Chazros, spelled out with the C and ending in an S, that's the Greek way to spell it. Um, Greeks were obsessed with the idea that every Persian's name ended in the letter S, or Sigma in Greek, which is not true. One alternate spelling is K-H-O-S-R-A-U. And I also have in my other presentation 
um, Chosro spelled as K-H-O-S-R-O-W. I'm not sure which of those two is the more correct um, because I don't really know any Iranian languages, but, you know, one of those is correct and not Chosro's as it's spelled by Procopius. Um, Chosro's did manage to translate the works of Plato and Aristotle into Pavlavi, and that is possibly how the Arabs later famously had the Greek classics, was via the Persians. We also know that Chosro's commissioned a series of biographies on the Sasanian kings before him, but all of those have been lost except for the one about Ardashir I, the guy who founded the Sasanian Empire. So, I hope that this has been useful and interesting, and in the near, very near future I'm going to be posting a video going over the history of the Sasanian Empire, and hopefully once you've watched this you'll have a pretty good appreciation for how it actually works and what it's like.